Welcome to A Growing Concern. We're going to do two half-hour segments tonight. And uh, the second segment is going to be with a fish biologist is going to talk about the effects of fluoride on the environment and on fish. This first segment is going to be with uh, Dr. Bill Osmondson. He's on here on my right. And he's a dentist. And he's got a little story to tell about how he once believed, as all dentists do, how great fluoride was or is. And uh, he got digging around and found out, uh, well, let him tell his story here, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. <laughs> nice welcome, to be with you. Welcome to the program, Bill. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. All right. Yes, indeed, I promoted water fluoridation. You actually for about, promoted it. I did. For about 25 years, I have a master's in public health, and um, I felt like it was definitely a benefit, a reduction in tooth decay. Um, I, in fact, had a game that I played with my employees that I would guess whether the person had been on water fluoridation um, before I even knew them. In other words, I'd look in their mouth, the patient's mouth, and say, yep, this patient's had water fluoridation. They grew up in town. They grew up here. And, and I was usually right. Not always. Usually right. But after looking at the science, I realized that what I had been actually looking at was I was comparing the rich and the poor, not the water <laughs> fluoridation. Right. The rich have better health better dental health, better overall health. Now, whether it's because they're healthy or whether it's because they're rich, I think it's because they're healthy, they're able to earn more. I think a lot of it's the, uh, the nutrition. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. sure. sure. And so I, as I understand you, when you were talking when uh, Dr. Paul Conant was here that you were actually asked by, by uh, some of your, uh, uh, the people that you worked on, and, and that, that encouraged you to, to do some digging. Well, one of the things, uh, I had a, a carpenter that worked for me did, doing cabinet work, and he said, to, Bill, what do you think about fluoride? And I said, oh, it's wonderful. And he said, well, what about water fluoridation, swallowing it? And I said, oh, yeah, it's great, great. And he said, what do you think about giving it to people without their consent? And I remember distinctly <laughs> yeah. that my mouth opened up and um. nothing came out. Mm -hmm. I remember doing a, a, a debate with a, another dentist, and I said, one of the things that convinced me that we should look once again at fluoridation was the fact that we should have freedom of choice. That people should be given the freedom to choose what they want. Mm -hmm. And he turned to me and said, I fully agree with that. Well, if we believe in freedom, then why don't we give each other freedom? What right do you have to vote medication on me without my consent? I, as a doctor, can't give you medication without consent, your consent. Mm -hmm. And yet fluoridation, because the doctors can't, the government really can't, then we're, what we're trying to do is go to the public and say, neighbors, vote fluoride on each other. It's crazy. It's well, insane. And that's what's going on right now, because since, since the city passed that, uh, whatever it was, an ordinance or whatever, that they're, they are gathering signatures, and they just passed their two-week hump day, and they've got less than two weeks to collect the, the twenty to 30,000 signatures to put it onto a vote, which I think is an important thing. But as you say, I don't know if it's really fair for someone to vote, vote the fluoride onto somebody else. Uh, it, it's not. Um, cleanwaterportland.org. Go there and you can find out how to help out in gathering signatures or, or sign a signature if you're a Portland voting resident. Um, we need signatures. It's, it's very important to get those signatures um, so that people can vote and choose not to be fluoridated. You know, for one thing, those that promote fluoridation don't look at how much we're getting. I mean, the levels people are receiving, the amount of exposure, we call it in, in science, the exposure level that we're getting from all sources. Those that promote water fluoridation say, well, well, one part per million or 0.7 parts per million in the water. That's important. But some people drink a tremendous amount of water. Others don't drink very much. Uh, the average person drinks about one liter a day or about what quart. But the 90th percentile drinks about two quarts. But there are some people that drink as much as 11 quarts. Mm -hmm. So they're getting 11 times as much fluoride just from the water. Then they're, and babies are even getting much more. And that. even children. Oh, absolutely. And then, of course, we have our pesticides. We have our dental products. We have our medical problems. There's some wonderful antibiotics that have fluoride in them. There's some wonderful pesticides, if you like pesticides, <laughs> that have fluoride in them. And there's, uh, there's wonderful dental products. Uh, fluoride does have some benefit 
on the surface of the tooth. But it's like suntan lotion. You don't swallow the suntan lotion, you put it on the outside mm -hmm. of your body. So um, we don't want to swallow it, especially children um, at, with things like toothpaste or fluoridated water, we should not swallow right. it. I understand that some government agency, the uh, FTC or, or one of the agencies came out saying that it is very useful, but it's useful topically. But then those that promote its use in the water fluoridization have get left out that and they just advertise that it is that they FDC or whoever say it is useful and they don't mention the fact that it's topical. Yeah. So there's 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 this skewing going on there by those that promote it. And this has been going on since I remember because it was a year before I was born, 1945. And so now it's it's been yeah, you're going You're telling on. your age on, yeah, on television. Yeah, well, they know by now. They've watched <laughs> me get gray over the years here. <laughs> but it's been going on for all these years now, and they've had that that many years to, to promote it and to get people to accept it just like you did blindly. Yeah. You know? Well, I was uh, having a little extra time. I have two son-in-laws who are dentists, and uh, I had a little extra time as they were working busy. And I said um, to myself, look, we're wrong in mercury fillings. That, there's no question about that. That stuff is not safe in the sewer. It's not safe for me to dump it in the trash. If I get it out of somebody's mouth, I have to call a hazardous waste company to haul it away. What makes it safe in your mouth? Mm -hmm. Nothing. So I knew mercury fillings were bad, and, and I knew that we, we didn't know how the mouth opened and closed, really, uh, and temporal mandibular disorders. And I thought, well, there's got to be... And I looked down, and I saw my toothpaste tubes that I handed out to patients. And I have, a, I have a pictures of it. I, right. I, I just immediately went over, and I... I took my camera out and I took pictures of, of the um, uh, Crest toothpaste and I read the label, which <clears throat> I hadn't done for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the label said, um, one of the things it says is do not swallow. Okay, that's probably wise. And use a pea-sized amount of toothpaste. So what I did is I squeezed a pea size of toothpaste onto a toothbrush. Now this is actually twice the size of pea size that should be used. And I squeeze that on out, and, and, it's, and the source, it says drug facts, because we know fluoride is a drug, and, and it says uh, that much, and I calculated it out, looked up in the research, and it means a quarter milligram of fluoride is in a pea-sized amount of toothpaste. And the FDA says don't swallow that. Well, that's the same amount of fluoride that they want to put in Portland water, a quarter milligram in about every glass of water. Now, if the Food and Drug Administration says do not swallow, mm -hmm. then the city of Portland should also say about their water, do, do not, not swallow, swallow a glass mm -hmm. of this water. That's the same warning that should be done. So the FDA is in charge of fluoridated water. Now, I, I want to I hit something that's really, really important. I want everybody to, to, to understand this carefully. If you add up the risk factors of why the FDA says do not swallow, we're looking at the damage being caused as greater than tobacco smoking. And we know that there's a lot of risk in tobacco smoking, lung cancer, gum disease, all kinds of problems. Heart and problems. Heart problems, yeah. it goes on and on. But this is worse than that. This is worse economically than the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And that's what governments are doing to us. We're looking at about one and a half trillion dollars of damage in the United States. About $7,000 per person loss of economic income. That is huge. Even if I am only 1% correct, that would be $70 per year per person. The city says, we're going to save you $19 a year in tooth decay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, the, and if I'm 1% correct, it's $70 yeah. per person per year. That's about, what, four times roughly the amount of, of, that, that's, that we're going to uh, save yeah, in these, dentistry. How are those figures tabulated? Where do they well, come from? I was hoping you'd <laughs> ask that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, so let's you're ready for me. Good to know. <laughs> Good I want to know. look at this a little bit more because I hope that you just go, I don't believe you, Bill, because... That's what you have to do with everything that is told to you by your good government. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. Show me the facts. All okay. Right. Now, there's a study that just came out by Choi. Uh, Harvard-funded, 
Now, Harvard's that little school out east, okay, that, that they think mm -hmm. they're pretty hot. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, a lot of times they well, are. The world okay? thinks they are, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty good. And it was published in a f federal government um, peer-reviewed journal. And they're showing that, and I'll get into it, that study a little bit more, which is very important. They're showing that there's a seven IQ point loss per person in the average of 27 human studies. Now, one of those human studies has a graph here. And this is a measurement of the amount of, uh, this is the IQ graph of blue, of the controls. You have the very, very gifted. You have those that are mentally challenged. In, in science, we would call those mentally retarded. There's all kinds of different terms now for it. But those that are low IQ and high IQ, with most people in the middle. When their fluoride in their blood, which was drawn and measured in the blood, they don't do that here in Portland. They just hope that they're giving people the right amount. When their blood level went on up to 0 0.08 parts per million, the IQ shifted for the entire population down about half a standard deviation, which is what was found in this study, 0.45 standard deviations loss, which is about seven IQ point loss. Now, the, the, the critics of this Harvard study would say, oh, well, well, those were studies out of China. First of all, let's look at that. China CDC says, don't do it. It's banned in China because the chemicals are not safe. And so what do they do with the chemicals? They send them over here and we put them in our water. Mm -hmm. We buy their toxic waste from China and we force everybody to eat it here. That doesn't make sense to me. Okay, so China CDC says, don't swallow. But our, 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 our scientists here say, oh, but that's China study. Their science is bad, their chemicals are good. Their science showing that the chemicals are bad is bad no, science. Bad. <laughs> but the chemicals are wonderful. And you say, well, what's the science to show me that there's wonderful chemicals? Uh, we have an animal study that showed that it really wasn't too bad. Oh, come on. This is 27 uh, human studies, far more powerful. So I looked at the United States. And on this lower graph here, what I did is I ranked the states of the United States, all 50 states, with those that fluoridated almost nothing and those that fluoridated 100%. Okay, 100% would be at this end. So there we go, fluoridation from zero to 100%. And I plotted each of the different states on there on the percentage of the population or the ranking of the, of the people on mentally retarded rates per 10,000, okay? So this is, this is where we have it going on up. There are about 50 per 10,000 mentally retarded in the states with the least amount of fluoridation. And there's about 170 per 10,000, three times. That's about a half a standard deviation. The same is up here. If you go a half a standard deviation over, that's exactly what this curve would be, half a standard deviation. So what the studies are showing in China and in other countries where they've actually measured mental retardation and where they've measured the IQ with fluoride, that's exactly happening in the United States also. It just isn't being studied. It's not being studied. Yeah. And so we claim it's safe because we haven't done any studying. That's like saying, well, we've never tried somebody um, jumping off the moon, and so we're going to find... I mean, you, you, you got to do the studies. You can't say it's safe without well, like, doing like the studies. Like I was saying earlier, they used to x-ray people's feet to get their shoes fit. <laughs> I don't think they studied that, and then they come to find out that it's, it causes cancer. Yeah. It's the exact so, same uh, too much doctors know everything attitude without, without any research. You know, one of the most important things that I was told by my mentor when I started dental school was he said, Bill, remember, in order to pass, you have to learn 80% of what we tell you. I thought, 80%, okay, that's a B. It's okay, a B, yeah, percent. percent But he said, always remember that 50% of what we teach you is wrong. We just don't <laughs> know what's wrong. Boy. So, so we have to always have that skeptical view of, this is what's being told to me, fine. But is it right? Don't always believe your doctor or anybody. You, you have to take it and say, does that make sense to me? Look at stuff up on the internet. Be, be a critical thinker of what's happening. Absolutely. And one of the worst things is this is cutting down on cognitive reasoning. Now, if you're a teacher teaching special education, you know how tough these kids are and how hard they work. If you're an employer 
and you have employees that you're saying, why can't they remember this? Why can't they think logically through that? What we're going to be doing is adding more fluoride, which is going to make that even worse. Mm -hmm. The costs of this are tremendous. For every IQ point loss, the estimate is about $1,000 loss of economic income. In other words, if you have 100 IQ and you drop that down to 93 IQ, then you're going to have an, on average, about $7,000 less income. We know that if you look at dropouts from high school, there, there are very, very few dropouts from high school with IQs 90 or above. Almost all of the dropping out of, from high school is with lower IQ. They get discouraged. They can't make it in, in high school. They struggle. And that's what we're doing. We're going to increase our dropouts from high school. We're going to increase our incarceration. We're going to increase our, um, those on welfare and those that don't have jobs. If you look at those that are lacking a job throughout the year for a month, there's a big skewing to more with the lower IQ. Our brains are more important than teeth. We've got to get that across to the dentists and the public health people. Brains are mm -hmm. more important than teeth. And what the dentists are going to say to you is, that's not my job to look at the brains. My job is to look at the teeth. Okay, let's look at the teeth. Okay, I got another chart here. All right. Uh, let's look at teeth because I'm a dentist. We've got about 10 minutes, so we're, okay. we're, we're moving along. Uh, we're good moving here. along. Okay, let's look at teeth. Here's comparison to different countries of the world. We have many of them, and when they get the camera on that graph over here, there we go. What we've got is, is this graph is uh, many countries of the world that essentially have no fluoridation or almost nothing. Which is most of Europe these days. Most of Europe. The Europeans do not recommend fluoride supplements in any form. Mm -hmm. The dental associations. Um, they've banned it, outlawed it. There's, there's very little fluoridation in Europe. There's a little bit of fluoride salt in, in this France, but that's being decreased. There's some in Switzerland, and that's a uh, um, very small amount. Okay, there are some fluoridated countries like Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, and the United States that are predominantly fluoridated. We can see here on this graph that all these countries back about 1970 had a lot of decay. The United States is the red line. We had dropped our decay previous to that. So uh, we, we kept on dropping it down to about 2000 when it was about one cavity decayed missing field teeth per 12 year old child. But all the other countries have done the same thing, even without fluoridation. Even without fluoride. It doesn't make any difference whether you have fluoridation or not, it's dropped the same. It, it's interesting how the um, pro fluoridation people in Portland were saying, well, um, we have such a terrible decay rate in Oregon. Yes, we have a decay rate in Oregon that's high. Not that much higher than the rest of the states, but we do have a high decay rate. Any decay rate is too high. But Portland doesn't. So what they're doing is they're using Oregon data to say that we need to fluoridate Portland, and Portland's actually very good, very low. We have less uh, decay in Portland than they do in, for instance, Vancouver or Washington, where they have a lot of fluoridation. So it, it's not going to reduce our decay rates here in, in Portland. So um, what you're saying that the, the, the people are promoting this are, are cherry picking their information. Uh, to say that they're cherry picking is absolutely correct. Um, they're not only cherry, cherry picking the, the uh, studies, but when they see a study, they're cherry picking and skewing the data to their bias. And when they get a, a group of dentists together to talk about fluoridation, whether it's effective, they make sure that the dentists are all believers. It's kind of like saying, well, let's find out if the Chevy Volt is the most popular car in the nation. So we're going to get all the Chevy dealers Chevy to come dealers. in <laughs> <laughs> and ask them if that's the most, uh, I mean, come on. Okay, uh, here's another graph. Um, this one is published in the Amer Journal of American Dental Association. And we can see here, there's blue lines, and this is when the water fluoridation is less than three parts per million. When we get to 0.3 to 0.7 parts per million, this is how much dental fluorosis is there. And this is 7 to 1.2. That's how much dental fluorosis is there. And over 1.2, this is how much dental fluorosis is there. So as we increase the fluoride in the water, we increase the amount of dental fluorosis. That's a toxic, that's a sign of a toxic excess 
exposure when the child was young. They had gotten too much fluoride. I diagnosed that daily on patients, many of them in, in Portland. Hey, hang on a second. I'm already diagnosing patients with too much fluoride that live in, in Portland. But were they always living in Portland? Though? Yes. They were. So why are we giving them more? Mm -hmm. What's the scientific basis for giving them more fluoride when they already have, have signs of toxic excess fluoride ingestion? And if, if it's it, affecting the teeth that way, what's it doing in other parts of the body? Precisely. So what we've got here now on the red lines, uh, back on up to the top here. Up She's on her way. There we go. <laughs> You're getting there. That's good. good camera now move. look at the red lines coming across here. This is the caries experience. This is the decay. So if you, if you want to, you can have 0.3 parts per million or less, and your decay rate's going to be here. If you increase the fluoride, your decay rate's going to really drop a huge amount there, right? And, oh, man, we're going to just have a huge drop again. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it doesn't really make any difference what you've got there. Your decay rates are going to remain about the same, but your signs of excess exposure are going to mm -hmm. go up. Mm -hmm. So based on the fact that it doesn't work, we're going to fluoridate Portland. So what do the people that promote this say that well, there's no science that says that, that, it's, that it's dangerous? When, when you know, you've had four or five graphs, three or four graphs that, that have proved at least that it needs to be looked at, if nothing else. Partly, they don't look at total exposure. Let me look at one more graph here. All right. It's very interesting. I love your graphs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One more graph that this is from the Environmental Protection Agency and their dose response analysis. Government publication put out by the government back in uh, 2011 because they were talking about what about lowering the amount of fluoride in the water? Should, should we lower it a little bit more? National Research Council said, yes, you must. EPA says, well, 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 should we? Let's get some discussion on it. So what we have here is this graph, and I added this down at the end. So disregard that down there at the end for just a second. The graph starts out at six months old. I put in this, the babies down here because they don't even include this. This black line is everybody above the black line is getting too much fluoride, according to the government. This is what we have here of, of how much fluoride they feel would be safe. And in order to make it so that it didn't look so bad, what they did is they said, we're going to increase the, quote, safe amount by one third. There's no science to support that, but we're going to say you can have a third more fluoride and still be safe. And, oh, by the way, we're going to knock out infants because, um, well, um, uh, you know, babies don't count. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, mm, let's only do it to the 90th percentile. In other words, 10% of the population, they don't count either. They're just drinking too much water, so we're not going to include them. If we included those other people, this graph would, the blue lines would be way up here if we included what they actually have as their dose response analysis. Now, this black line should be down. You're looking at the vast majority of infants having too much fluoride. Most of children under the age of around seven are getting too much fluoride. This is government statistics, the government saying this, the EPA saying it, and, and in order to do that, they kind of had to cook their data mm -hmm. to make and, it look this good. And according to the city council, and I'm sure every city council in the country, it's the children is why they're doing this. It isn't the adult cavities that they're, that they're pushing, it's, it's the children's cavities. Right, because, because those are the toughest people to work with. They don't understand that they've got this cavities because they've been eating junk food. They don't understand that it's because they haven't been brushing and flossing. They don't know how to do it, and they're scared. And I tell you what, I, I just, I have my hat off to any dentist who helps children who have cavities. We all want to prevent their decay. There's no question about it. But fluoridation is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Well, from what I've been gathering and I've been doing these shows and talking to people for a while, the answer to me is, is more nutrition and hygiene, like you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Um, there are many uh, children specialists that talked to me in, in school and they said the vast majority of us pedodontists feel that nutrition is more important than brushing and flossing for a child that's very young. Now, one of the biggest problems, of course, is putting a baby to bed with a bottle of juice, milk, especially sugared milk or juices, and then they'll suckle on it while they're asleep. So that's a, that's a really no-no. Um, if at all possible, breastfeed the baby because mother's milk contains virtually no fluoride in it. Even if they're drinking fluoride? 
even if they're drinking fluoride, it's ver That's good to in know. In 57% of the cases of, in this one study, they couldn't find any fluoride in mother's milk. Now, if, if nature intended infants to have fluoride, then it failed on mother's milk. So you either have to say mother's milk is correct with no fluoride, or you have to say mother's milk is flawed. You got to take your pick. Mm -hmm. And and I uh, tell you what, I think history is pretty clear that we wouldn't be here without mother's milk. Right, <laughs> okay? right. It's essential, and we've survived because of it. So um, mother's milk has the is the ideal nutrition, and it does not have fluoride. Mm -hmm. Infants should not get fluoride. Their body sizes are too small. Their brains are developing. And Rapidly. it's that neurologic <laughs> development. Here's, here's the thing about the brain. This is what really scares me, amongst other things. The animal studies are showing that when they damage, for instance, rodents' brains with fluoride, they give the, the, the mouse too much fluoride or the mice, a whole group of them. And then they stop giving them too much and they just follow that brain damage throughout their life and their children's, and their children's, and their children's, they see the damage continuing for at least three generations when they've ended the studies that I've seen. So that means that when they add too much fluoride to the water, or they're giving fluoride supplements, or you're allowing your child to swallow that fluoride toothpaste, that means that the damage that they're doing to themselves will genetically, biologically pass on to, if it's your child, to your grandchildren, to your great-grandchildren and to your great-great-grandchildren, the damage will pass. So what we do right now is extremely important for at least three generations, 70, 80 years. And we're looking at about the third generation from when they started doing this in the yes. beginning as well. Yes. Well, I think, I think we have the next guest in here. We're down to just about the last couple of minutes. There's so many points that we could go into and I invite you back in the near future because, as you mentioned, we're collecting those, those uh, resolution, uh, signatures, signatures yeah. for the referendum. It's going to be on, on a ballot in, in uh, May of 2014. We're going to have a lot of time to talk about this. But I kind of want to go back as a parting shot on that toothpaste that you talked about, that, uh, that little bit that you showed me there. Uh, is that industrial in there, or is that pharmaceutical that's in there? No, I was talking to the um, Food and Drug Administration, uh, no, Center for Disease Control, dentist, and I said, so we're looking at pharmaceutical-grade fluoride in this toothpaste, right? And he said, actually, Bill, it's um, the same stuff they put in water. Which is industrial-grade. Yeah, yeah. And what is the difference? Well, um, the difference, it contains... Uh, contaminants such as arsenic, lead, radionucleotides, aluminum. There's all these other chemicals in there that are really serious problems. Do not swallow. That's the Food and Drug Administration it says do not swallow. And I, I mean, that's the wisest thing to do. If they fluoridate our water, don't um, go to the F Portland restaurants and eat and drink their water. Uh, don't drink, eat their soups. Make sure that they're using um, fluoride-free water for their cooking. Um, this, this is a really serious problem. There are some people that have problems and reactions just from taking a bath or a shower in fluoridated water. Mm -hmm. Just the absorption in the skin from that from the no, chemicals is too much of a problem. Skin is our largest organ, so yes. it's, it's, it's immediately being affected by it. Yes. So, like I said, we could go on and on. There's an awful lot to talk about, and we'll be doing this in the future. We want to encourage people uh, one more time to please get uh, get a hold of the folks down at the, uh, was it Clean Water Portland? That's cleanwaterportland.org. We need to collect these signatures because we need to put this to a vote. Even though you don't have necessarily have the, the ethical and the moral right to vote for someone else to uh, to uh, have this this. Uh, toxic chemical in their water, you at least have the right to, uh, to uh, vote it not to be put in the water. Right. You know, I, right. I think that, then, and then if you, want, if you want to, you know, use a toothpaste, spit it out. The salt is, is a way, the, the mouthwashes. There are other ways to do this that are, that, that are proven to be topically useful, whereas swallowing it systemically, I think you folks call it, right. it's not useful. Yeah, one quick point. If people say, I don't believe you, Bill, I want to swallow fluoride. I want to swallow it. And if you don't allow me to have fluoride in my water, then I'm not going to get it. That's not true. All you have to do is swallow a pea size of toothpaste uh, right. and you've got your fluoride. You got your We've fluoride. got everybody can get fluoride. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. If you don't have fluoridated water and you want it, 
Just disobey the FDA and you can do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I hope we've, uh, we've got this thing started off and we're going to do a lot more of this in the future. Bill, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank and, you and, so much and, for having me. This has been great and you really wet my whistle and doing a little bit more digging on my own.